Hey, Zerm listeners, there is a new episode of Season 3, Love is Blind, After the Altar. Let's watch. I mean, whatever. Like, you signed up for it. You signed your name on it. Huh. Matt and Colleen just fight a lot. Like, point blank, period. They fight with each other a lot. It's just like weird vibes, you know? I don't know. So I think what Raven is referring to is when they're in public, like in a situation like this, the two of them will play fight with each other. And for Raven, it is uncomfortable for her to be in the presence of that or to watch that. I don't know if I get a chance to talk about this very often, but there are different styles of play fighting. I think most couples engage in at least a little bit of it, and some couples engage in a lot of it. It can be healthy and it can be unhealthy. Of course, when you see stuff like this, it's possible that they are expressing hostility, hurt feelings toward each other through the guise of joking around, right? So it's possible the two of them have a lot of hidden hostility and they're passive aggressively being hostile with each other through jokes. They could claim like, look, I'm just joking. I, I, I was just making jokes. You can't take a joke when it really is being communicated and felt as a hostile, aggressive criticism, especially in front of other people, you know, to, to do it in front of other people. So that can be a possibility. It's also a possibility that they just have a real playful way of communicating and they both intend and both receive it as playful and not as hurtful. So it's possible that for Raven, that's not her style. She doesn't like that sort of thing. And so that triggers her or scares her or something she's misinterpreting it, or she's interpreting it accurately in that it is awkward. It is going too far. It is an expression of anger and hostility and criticism. So hard to know. We haven't seen much of this yet, though, to my knowledge. So I think we might be seeing an aspect of the relationship that we haven't seen before. So let's let's keep an eye on that. What's up, you guys? What's up, Peace? Oh, I don't think this vodka hey, is strong enough. What's up, Brennan? Hey. Okay. You want a quesadilla? No. Suddenly, I just lost my appetite. You want a no. you deal with this? No, I don't. <laughs> hey, Alex. To catch you up, there have been a lot of conversations prior to this get-together. This is Alexa's birthday party. We heard from Brennan saying that although he's fine with the other guys being friends with Cole, he doesn't want to be friends with Cole. Brennan doesn't even want to hang out with Cole at all. So the guys, when they had their get-together, Cole was not invited. And you can make your own call as to whether or not that is fair of Brennan to do. I think what Brennan would say is that he believes Cole is the way Zeneb will characterize him. And yeah, if you take Zeneb's story as at least 50% you know, accurate, 60% accurate, then absolutely Cole is a pretty problematic individual. It would be an act of solidarity with your friend and with your wife and with all victims of that kind of abuse to actually say, I'm not going to hang out with the guy. I, I don't want to be around him and I will stand by that decision. So I think that's where Brandon is coming from. But it depends on whether or not you trust Zeneb's take, right? If you trust her take, then it kind of makes sense. If you don't, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to reject Cole. So now, Brennan can be friends or unfriends or whatever with anyone he wants to be. That's a personal choice that he makes. And there are consequences to those decisions and he's free to make them, of course. So we just saw Cole went up to Brennan and said, hey, how's it going? And Brennan had an uncomfortable look on his face. It also seems that for the women, they all still agree that Cole is a problematic individual and still believe Zeneb's story. I'm pretty sure this was filmed after the reunion because Cole refers to the cuties, the tangerine, the oranges, a scene as if he has seen it. Not only is it after the reunion, but it's after the reunion aired on Netflix. So this party must have happened in the last month-ish, six weeks, two, two months or something. The other thing is that Raven and SK are still together. So yeah, this must have been right after the reunion. And because I, I think if I remember right, it wasn't long after the reunion, or it seemed like it was before the reunion, that it came out that SK had, or seemingly, allegedly, had been cheating on other women with a, with Raven or vice versa, cheating on Raven with other women. There are some pretty outrageous allegations that he went on the show already in at least one relationship, if not multiple, and was lying to a, a number of women, that, that kind of, I don't know if any of that's true, but so SK and Raven are still together. Also, there was a scene in which Nancy was talking with her family 
And it seemed as though either they knew to talk about this or the producers prompt them, prompted them to talk about it. Nancy went to her family, her mom and her brother, and said, hey, at the wedding, when I was left at the altar, I needed to have some time to process things. And so for you, the two of you, mom and brother, to come at me and Bartise so strong and so quickly was bothersome to me. And she, I mean, Nancy wasn't being super critical, but just kind of voicing that again. And the mom and the brother were saying, look, I'm going to fight for you. My family is important to me. And when someone messes with someone in my family, my daughter in particular, I'm going to come after them. There's just really no options there. And Nancy seemed to be okay with that to some extent. And yeah, I, I totally understand that, especially when when I saw it the first time, when I saw the altar scene between Nancy and Bartise, the first time, I didn't know what I would learn later, which was that Bartise was seemingly leading her on and was not giving any kind of hints as to what his true intentions were, which was to say no at the altar. And Nancy had a lot of reasons, legitimate reasons to believe that Bartise was gonna say yes. And you know, it's one thing to break up with someone, right? All's fair in love and war, as, as they say, meaning that if you fall out of love with someone, if Bartise didn't wanna marry her, he's entitled to that and that's fine. But how do you go about it, right? Do you trick someone? Because, and I think I talked about this before, if, You'd hope that someone in Bartise's position would, would at the very least refrain from giving hints that he was going to say yes, right? But at best, s screw the show, right? Screw what the producers are wanting you to do. Just go to Nancy behind closed doors away from the cameras and say, by the way, Nancy, I'm going to say no. And I, I don't want you to be blindsided. I'm sorry. Let's talk about it. Basically, I'm breaking up with you right now. And we have to act like this didn't happen because of the show. So you can make your own choice about that. But, uh, you know, it, it would feel really bad to me if I reveal it to you on the altar. I don't want to do that. I'm going to tell you here now. It seemed as though Cole and Zeneb had that conversation a couple of nights before the wedding, which I imagine a number of couples hopefully have that conversation prior, especially if they're going to say no, right? So yeah, if the family wanted to go after him in that way, it makes more sense to me having known that. The other thing that Nancy was talking with her parent, her, her mom and her brother about was that she wanted to be friends with Bartise. And the mom and the brother were like, particularly the mom were like, I'm not going to be friends with that guy. I hate him, that kind of stuff. And Nancy was saying, well, you know, you're entitled to that, but I don't know. I just want to be friends. And the mom and the brother were saying, well, why do you want to be friends? What's the purpose? What's the outcome? What are you trying to get out of engaging in a friendship with Bartise? And Nancy didn't have a clear answer to that. She started to cry. And it seemed as though from the scene that Nancy was still pining, was still holding on, was still hoping that something could happen with Bartise and was having a hard time admitting that to herself. But seemingly that's what she was communicating or realizing or something. It, it certainly seemed as though that's what the mom, in fact, they explicitly said something like, you're holding on, you're, you're not letting go, that kind of thing. So you know what I think about that, or at least I hope you do, that grief and loss, it, it is normal to hold on, so to speak. The whole thing about let it go, let it go, let it go is certainly a worthy goal if that's what you're searching for, if that's what you're trying to get to. But to expect yourself and other people to just quickly move on and quickly let go without considering the emotional ties that we have developed biologically to other people is inhumane. So is it possible and normal if Nancy, even at this point, still had a part of her heart wishing and hoping, perhaps irrationally, that her and Bartise would get back together? Yeah. In fact, I would expect that and I would kind of almost hope for that. Not for Nancy to suffer, but it would show that Nancy was real. It would show that Nancy was legit in love and legit wanted to get married to him, right? Imagine that for yourself. I think this, what is it, maybe six, 12 months after the altar at this point? It's totally normal. I know people who have breakups with someone after, say, even just, well, like my co host, Bob, on my audio podcast. He had a significant relationship 20 some odd years ago. I was friends with him, best friends with him at the time, and I was ground zero during that whole thing. And he went out with her for, I don't know, nine or 10 months, and it was a pretty intense relationship. They lived together for a while. There was a breakup, he got dumped, and for six years, 
after that, he was pining for her. He was still thinking about her. There was a part of, of him that still wanted to rekindle that relationship, even though rationally he knew that wasn't possible or healthy for him or her. It's normal to do that. So he had a 10-month relationship and a six-year grieving process. That is normal because you can have intense feelings for a short amount of time. You, this show really engenders a lot of intense feelings. So you could imagine that Nancy would have those intense feelings and then would have taken a long time, maybe even beyond this point, to fully emotionally move on. Now, should she try to engage in a relationship with him? No, probably not, right? That's just harming herself. Would I fault her as a human being or even as a therapist if she were to try? No. Sometimes you have to bark up that tree to get an answer so that your heart can really feel, you know, it's one thing. So there's a possibility that for Nancy in her mind and her conscious understanding, her rational mind, her intellect knows that absolutely Bartise doesn't want to be with her. And I, you know, Nancy would say to herself, I don't want to be with Bartise given the way that I know him today. So that that's just off the table. That's 100%. There's really no amb ambiguity there. And a part of her heart would absolutely take him back if he were to even hint at rekindling the relationship. Is that possible? Yeah. And is that normal? Yes. <laughs> is that healthy? Sure. Uh, it's not unhealthy or healthy. It's just a normal part of the human heart. You know, the alternative to that is that we're robots and that as soon as, you know, we're in love, we're in love, we're in love, we're going to get married, we're going to get married, we're going to get married, then all of a sudden, boom, no, we're not going to get married. The alternative to the Nancy scenario is suddenly, boom, your heart just turns off and you're just like, yep, logically, I have figured out that this relationship is bad moving on in life. We're not robots. That's not ideal. We're squishy, human, emotional creatures, chaotic, strange, mysterious creatures that don't make logical sense. And that's the beauty and the artistry and the magic of life and love, incidentally. So it's a, you take the good with the bad. Love has a lot of mystery and wonderfulness and glory, and it has its downside, which is that we get attached to people when they, even though they break up with us, even though they hurt us, you know, that sort of thing. And so it sucks, but I'd rather take the whole ball of wax than reject the whole thing and become a robot, you know, that kind of thing. Now, what I thought Nancy would say to her family when they were saying, why do you want to be friends with him? I thought she would say something, and maybe this is just me inserting my own values into the situation, would be for Nancy to say something like, well, we went through a lot together, and although I don't like the way he treated me toward the end, there was there were a lot of good moments, and I know that he's basically a good person. He has some issues, for sure, that he needs to work on, but he's not an evil human being. He's not abusive or some kind of toxic element in my life. And we bonded in a huge way, particularly in the pods. And I want to retain that relationship or at least some connection there. And I want to be friends with him, maybe even so that I can voice my anger at him and, and get that off my chest, you know? So... I, that's why I want to be friends with him. Now, Nancy could choose not to do that if that's what she wants to do, of course, but I thought she might say something along those lines. And it's possible that that isn't how she feels about it and that she only is trying to rekindle or she's been prompted by the producers to try to re-engage because it creates more drama for the show. I don't know. So it's possible that she doesn't want to be friends with him and she's just pining, or she actually does want to be friends in the way that I would imagine I would feel if I were in her shoes, but she doesn't feel she has the permission to say that or she's not self-aware of it or something. I don't know. Good, over here. Thank you. Hi. What's up? Good. How are you? There is no game plan going into this party with Cole. I will not be walking up to him, so if he expects to have conversation with me, he's going to have to over my way. And also to catch you up, in line with her postseason interviews, she was continuing to say in earlier episode here, this is a three-episode deal, that Zena believes that she stands by what she did. She stands by her perspective. She stands by her behavior at the altar and everything is fine with her. There doesn't seem to be any question mark as to her behavior, which you can make of as you will. I really did it once, but it was honestly my only option. I love it so much. How do you feel about seeing Cole? Do I need to do the linebacker? If you would just keep an eye on me. You know my face. I know. 
if you see me and you're just like, hey, honey, you need to fix your face, just tell me that. Nice to meet you, Alex. Oh, the other thing that I remember, there were a lot of little scenes that I just didn't feel like reacting to, but now I guess feel like reacting to. There was a pretty big conversation with the fellas around Matt and Colleen not living together. They were warming up to the idea, but were definitely saying it was strange and it didn't seem to be okay with them. And I just find those conversations to be bizarre. It's like, what is it to you if two people who are married aren't living together? They are planning on living together in the future. But even if they weren't, what is it to you? How does it harm you? Why does it seem so upsetting to you? As It doesn't have anything to do with you. And is it possible that your ideas about such matters are culturally influenced and you've been indoctrinated into this very rigid point of view? The exact same things were said in my lifetime, and even today there are some weirdos that are still saying this, that they don't understand gay people or trans people. It's like, it's not, it's weird. I don't know. I don't feel comfortable with that. And it's like, is it possible that you don't feel comfortable with it because you just don't know anything about it? Just just draw a question mark around it for yourself. Don't draw conclusions based on a question mark, right? It's like, hmm, I don't I've never been to Denmark before. I don't know what it's like. I'm going to I'm going to assume it's evil. <laughs> I mean, why do you insert bad things into a sp- a black abyss of questions, you know, just, just say, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I've, I've never heard of two people who were married, not living together. I, I guess my initial reaction is that doesn't sound good, but what do I know? Because I'm not a scientist in this area and I haven't looked in the research. I don't know the data. So I'm just going to have to put a question mark on that. And then I can insert data, which is, Hey, Matt and Colleen, how's it for you? And they're saying they're fine with it. There seemed to be some odd dynamics between Matt and Colleen as they were talking about lives not living together. Again, Colleen seems to come across as a little scared and passive about it, and Matt seems to be a little bit more overbearing. I don't know. It just seems kind of the their way of communicating. It's really hard to tell based on a show if any of that is accurate. But I will say for the record that people in long-term relationships, married or not, do not need to live together in order for their marriage to be viable, right? If you're going to have kids... That's going to be a challenge, but there's a scenario where everyone kind of agrees that this is acceptable. Say, for example, you get married and one person gets a job in another town and because of their jobs, both of them have to be in a long distance relationship for a time. Most people say, yeah, if they understand the circumstances, they'll be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. SK and Raven were, they weren't married, but they were involved living in different cities. No one questioned that, right? We have a a normalcy around people having long-distance relationships, even married at times, again, if it's dictated by jobs, right? So somehow that's okay, but if you're in the same town, then it's completely abhorrent and unhealthy and ridiculous. Could it be an indication that there's something wrong with Matt and Colleen? Sure, absolutely. Could they be living together from the very beginning and also have the same problem? Yes. (laughs) So there's nothing wrong with living apart. There's nothing wrong with sleeping in different beds or different rooms or having different blankets. You know, some people are even like, I can't remember where I was seeing this, but some people were like, you know what? And they, they're they they're ashamed of themselves. They're worried they're going to get judged. They're like, you know what? I have a different blanket than my partner, you know, even though they're in the same bed, because my partner tends to yank the blanket off or we like different amounts of blankets. Is that okay? Are we unhealthy? And I'm just like, my goodness, <laughs> people like stop judging things that you don't know anything about. It's okay for people to make their own choices about that. Now, some people will point to research that shows that couples that sleep together tend to do a little bit better in their relationship. They have greater satisfaction. They stay together longer. I can't remember the exact statistic. The effect isn't very big. Because, of course, the factors that play into satisfaction and longevity in a relationship are numerous, right? And the more important factors to pay attention to are communication, attachment, self-awareness, emotional regulation, differentiation, values, how you parent together, how do you communicate together, uh, outside influences like oppression and racism and sexism and poverty. You know, there's a lot of factors that are known and obvious that will play into satisfaction and longevity of relationship. A tiny, tiny, you know, distant, uh, you know, in the if you prioritize all the factors that one would attribute relationship satisfaction to, and and things that you should focus on as a couple to try to increase satisfaction and longevity in a relationship, you know, a dis, you know, far, far down on the list would be, should we sleep together or not? And uh, uh, and it is something to consider because 
when you sleep together, it's possible, and it's it's certainly not a necessary thing in a relationship, but it is possible, and it stands to reason that we did evolve sleeping next to our people. When we were in, on the African savanna 200,000 years ago, and even just 50 years ago, and around the world, there are still communities where they do this, and maybe some of you, where you not only sleep with your partner, but you sleep with your kids and your parents and your cousins. Like everyone huddles together for safety and warmth and that sort of thing. And we seem to get, we probably get some comfort even though we're unconscious and asleep, but at the very least, as we're falling asleep and as we're waking up, we get some comfort and some blood pressure regulation, emotional regulation, attachment security by being physically next to someone, including when we are sleeping with someone, right? So it stands to reason that people who sleep together get a little bit of a boost, right? Potentially, not always though. But there's pros and cons, right? And a lot of you might attest to this, that you might sleep in different rooms because one of the individuals or both snores. And so what's the what's the trade-off? So if you sleep together, you get a little bit of that closeness that you can get in other venues as well, right? You can cuddle on the couch when you're awake and also get that as well. But so you get a little bit of that closeness when you're sleeping together. But say the snoring ruins one person's sleep. So they get two or three hours of bad sleep a night. That negative is going to far outweigh any positive you get by sleeping next to each other. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of different things to consider. And it, anyway, rant over the main topic sentence is that it, once again, we're seeing the indoctrination of culture because, you know, these individuals didn't emerge into the universe when they were born with these ideas. They were indoctrinated into a mindset of these ideas. And when we see that, it's a it's an easy example of cultural indoctrination that is harmful, right? It's probably not extremely harmful, but it is harmful in that, one, it stigmatizes people that don't live together or don't sleep together unnecessarily and harmfully. And it prevents people from accessing that option of not sleeping together or having a different blanket or something or not even living in the same house when it might be best for them to do that because they worry about stigma from the outside or they have internalized stigma for themselves. You know, I would take a guess and say that there are millions or, I don't know, tens of thousands of couples in the United States who would overall benefit by not sleeping in the same room or in the same bed. Now, it is a bit of a luxury, of course, because sometimes you just have a studio apartment and so there's nowhere else to sleep. But if there was the ability to sleep in a different room because of snoring, I'm guessing there are many couples who overall, in their relationship even, would be better off if they slept in different rooms because of the snoring issue, but they don't sleep in different rooms because of the outside stigma and the internalized stigma prevents them from even considering that or experimenting with that as an option, which is, you know, it's a problem not only for that issue, but more importantly for all the other indoctrination issue uh, elements within our society. You know, there are thousands of other elements within our culture that we've been indoctrinated into that are harmful and simplistic. All right, well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.